Um, but uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, um, Trent, as he mentioned last week, is on an airplane headed back home to Las Vegas. I'm Rob McMillan. I'm filling in for him as the uh, master of ceremonies, I guess. Um, and with that, I'll just uh, introduce uh, Dr. Joseph Paiva. Um, his, uh, he just posted up a uh, message in the chat yeah. with his email address. And his uh, full biography is in uh, the Mentoring Mondays website. And uh, <clears throat> I think I'll just give you a, a brief history of, of Joe. And uh, he is, um, uh, has been a professor um, teaching surveying courses and, and surveying for many, many years. He's been uh, vice president at Sokia, uh, also with Trimble, and um, I'm just really excited to have another session uh, with Joe. Um, I believe it was back in the mid '80s when I started surveying that I took a course that he developed, and uh, um, it was kind of a traveling road show from POB Magazine, and. Joe, uh, correct me if I get the uh, name of the course wrong, but I think it was something like improving your field measurement techniques. That sounds right. It was so far back in time, even I have forgotten. Yeah, so, well, suffice to say, he's a giant in the industry and we're happy to have him. So with that, I'll turn it over to Joe. So, thanks. Um, Rob, uh, glad to hear that uh, you are an old timer, uh, but really I am thinking that there's probably a lot of younger people for whom this material may be <clears throat> more appropriate. This isn't gonna be the kind of course that I did back in the 80s that you attended. So today uh, we're kind of focusing on some of the uh, key concepts that you might want to uh, know for the exams, uh, especially the FS probably in this case, uh, PES to some extent, uh, the state specific in some states may, uh, may call for this. And then uh, the CST, for those of you who are doing uh, CST work, uh, you might, uh, in fact, I know for a fact that you'll find uh, you'll find that uh, there, there's information that could be useful on the CST exam. In fact, I haven't taken the exam, but I've heard that in some areas, this material I'm covering today, which is Kogo and Traverse, uh, might even be more intense. So let me move into some general comments that I have for my students in college. Uh, so when we're talking about Traverse, uh, there's some general network comments and people always go, well, what the heck is a network? Well, a Traverse is a network, although you can have networks where you triangulate or um, uh, trilaterate, which is uh, make distance measurements or combinations of and so forth. And you can have horizontal control uh, for in your network. You can have vertical control and you can have both. Uh, and one of the things, because I'm throwing in a mixture of, I guess you could say, uh, computational things, uh, as well as a term identification that can come up on these exams. Uh, the term benchmark always refers to vertical control, at least from the definition that uh, an examiner would expect you to, to respond. So control surveys, as you probably know, are commonplace, although it's a strange thing. Sometimes I think that surveyors are not doing them as much as they used to, because control surveys are important for all kinds of work that surveyors do, because you need to set some kind of control. And sometimes we think of control as being ultra high NGS uh, quality, but no, you can set control for anything. Uh, you can set control for a topographic survey, for example. Uh, for some very coarse mapping. Uh, so there's different 
types that can be used. And of course, today, while we might use total stations or other similar kinds of equipment, GNSS technology is, of course, very common. Hopefully, you're using it uh, doing static observations rather than RTK, because RTK has certain issues with uh, how you can be sure you're getting good control. And when you do control, it is important to understand the importance of design. You don't just go out and randomly place control. Number one, you place it for the convenience of the future survey work you're going to do that's going to depend on the control. But you also need to think about what's called strength of figure. And we often say uh, nice quadrilaterals with diagonals, maybe two diagonals or nice triangles that are not too skinny are some of the things that you have to think about. But it also means you, you take the technology you're using into account, and I can't really get into that to a great extent here, because we don't have that much time. There's some computational things that I really want to spend time on. But, uh, but uh, just be aware of these kinds of things. Um, Here's a triangulation network. This happens to be a real one that was done for the uh, construction of the Delaware Memorial Bridge. So you can see some stations and a whole bunch of observations. And I have a feeling this may have been mostly triangulation, uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if there was some trilateration. I kind of doubt GNSS GPS was used at this time because this is fairly back in time. I don't know if you can, you'll see, you'll, you'll get the PDF of the slides eventually, but you may not be able to read the text here, but this comes from a sketch that was uh, reproduced in Professional Surveyor magazine, as many of you know, it's no longer called that, it's now XYHT, so, so certainly this picture would have shown up prior to that, I didn't keep records on when I uh, got this picture. So a traverse is a series of connected lines. We call them traverse stations. Angles and distances are measured. Somehow you come for a basis of, for directions that may be an assumed direction. It could be a given direction because you observe some known control. A traverse can be what we call open or closed. If it's open, there are no checks. If it's closed, it either checks back on the starting point, if it's a polygon, or onto a control point and a direction. So I just want to illustrate what I'm talking about. So you can have a traverse that runs like this, uh, starting at one point, ending at another. And if you measure all these angles and we measure all these distances, because of where we started, we can uh, compute uh, what this uh, connecting line is between our starting and ending points. However, uh, there are no checks. Uh, I mean, you can do some internal checks like um, doubling your angles, measuring direct and reverse, measuring, measuring your distances back and forth and so forth. But it doesn't always uh, tell you that uh, how much error you have accumulated. It doesn't tell you if you have any blunders. And certainly you can um, try to attack from the results anyway anything about systematic errors. Uh, you can have a closed traverse that would uh, start and end at the point it began from. So by because of the fact that it has to close back on itself, there's quite a few things you can now learn about, about, this, about the survey. Now on this open traverse, if we started from some kind of existing control that's at least as accurate as the survey we're planning to do, and we actually measure that direction, and we have a published coordinate for that point, and we close on some control, and there's, so there's a published coordinate for that point, and there's also a known direction. Now we have azimuth or angular checks, as well as position checks, similar to what we do in a closed uh, polygon. So, so, just be aware of those differences. And then we can have connecting traverses, uh, sometimes use the term connecting for those uh, open looking things and uh, loop for the ones that close on themselves. Um, so 
the field work and it's worth talking about this because this can come up, especially on the CST, I know. We talk about design, we talk about locations for densifying the surveys, into visibility between points, because when you're using total stations, you have to be able to see the next point and maybe more than one, uh, because that helps with redundancy. Uh, your geometry for the design, you set your stations, uh, whatever they need to be, and then you measure, you measure uh, witnesses or ties. So this is from a textbook that is so far back in time, I've forgotten which one it came from. I have quite a few excerpts from this textbook. But when you set traverse stations, you typically uh, would either set straddle hubs, so here's a cross that's formed, or a linear point like this. Uh, and uh, this is the traverse station and you set uh, four points on, on, on a line at whatever spacing, or you do this kind of tie, where this is your traverse station, in this case we have three trees, sorry, two trees and a telephone pole that wind up uh, being the ties to find, find that point. So I know you were thinking that I'd be talking about computations, but those are kinds of things that you need to be able to express or on a multiple choice exam read and understand uh, what is being written about setting stations or witnessing them or tying them in to be able to figure out if you're uh, using the correct terminology. So, so the traverse measurement process is you measure your angles in the field uh, and we we'll talk about how you measure angles. You come up with the basis for direction and that can be a whole bunch of ways and I've listed them here. You can read this for yourself. It's not very common, but there are actually things called surveying gyros. People do take astronomic observations. I've actually used both in my history. Uh, and then, of course, you can use GNSS. Uh, one thing I want to point out with using GNSS as a basis for uh, azimuth control or directional control is that it's sometimes not very good uh, depending on how you do it. And that there are good ways to do it, but there are also not so good ways to do it. So I want to point something out. Most manufacturers claim between one and two centimeters and a part or two per million of your baseline length for your RTK position uncertainty, and that's standard deviation, all right, 68% of the time, or 68% confidence. With static, maybe you can improve it to uh, half a centimeter uh, and a PPM. So if you imagine that we have a line that we're going to use as a basis for azimuth, and we take use RTK at each end, uh, we have a, an uncertainty of about six and a half hundredths at each end uh, and it turns out if you look at the worst case with that six tenths or seven tenths you have about 60 uh, an uncertainty of about 68 seconds in the line and what do i mean by that so you here's your 400 foot line and you have about you have a radius here of 0 0.066 you have an uncertainty here of 0 0.066 and so if you take the worst case, which would be going from this extremity to this extremity, but still staying within standard deviation, that angle right there is 68 seconds. So it's something you need to keep uh, aware of because sometimes people try to go back in retracing a survey and they try to recover an azimuth using this same technology, this same methodology. And so they may not be within a few seconds. They could easily be off by as much as a minute. And so you should be aware of this. So when you measure a traverse, uh, here's some hints that you know, you might, you're probably aware of if you've done traversing. So here I've measured, I'm going to measure this polygon and I'm going counterclockwise A, B, C, D, E. And, and one of the cool things about numbering your points counterclockwise is that if you then measure uh, interior angles, we have a standard terminology. So if you're measuring the angle at point B, that would be called angle ABC. So when we have angle ABC, 
uh, B is your instrument setup point where you're actually measuring the angle. A is the backsight point. C is the foresight point. So ABC has a specific terminology and rotation associated with it. And so it would mean that if you had B backsighting A, foresighting C, that you're turning this angle, which would be what's called an angle to the right, but it's also the interior angle which people like to have. Uh, because then you can do a simple check because we have a very simple n minus 2 times 180. This is what your interior angle should add up to. And you can do that pretty simply. Now, there are other ways to measure angles. And uh, here's another way to do it. This is very common in route surveying, highways and so forth. Uh, may not be as popular, but sometimes uh, expressed that way by many DOTs and where you do a traverse and you do what's called deflection angle. So you have your instrument set up here, you backsight uh, the backsight point over here. Then what you do is you invert your telescope. So you're now sighting in this direction, still reading zero, and then you deflect to the right or to the left. And so you actually put an R or an L next to the angular value or a plus or a minus. If you do plus or minus, you need to specify what your sign convention is. Most people use plus to the right, but they could easily do the opposite. Uh, and so that's a little bit different. Uh, now, once you finish the traverse with your unadjusted data, you can, you'll find if you calculate this thing out that it doesn't close. And so, uh, and so we have what's called an unadjusted traverse, which has an error of closure, which allows us to evaluate a little bit the quality of our work. Doesn't tell us the whole story. You still have to take, take care of your measurements to make sure you don't have systematic errors, because this type of error check is only good for helping you detect big blunders and for evaluating the random error. If all these distances are too large by 30 parts per million or 300 parts per million, it would still have the same uh, configuration and the same kind of gap and you wouldn't be able to tell that the systematic error is there in, in your survey. It's important to know your angles because I talked about interior angles and angles to the right, and I just wanted to mention a few things. So here's uh, 75 degrees for this interior angle. So hopefully you all know that the exterior angle would be 360 minus 75. I'm not going to do the math here, but I just wanted to point that out. Now here we have a deflection angle to the right if you're going in this direction. And so what's the interior angle? Hopefully you can all see that this would be 110. But that's if you're going in that direction. If you're going in this direction, hopefully you see that it's a 70 degree angle to the left. Um, here we have 125 degree exterior angle. Interior angle would be 360 minus 125. But if we have this, a deflection angle, we should be able to calculate the deflection angle, which would be 125 subtracted from 180. And this would be a deflection angle to the left if you're going in that direction. So knowing your angles is important. So here I said, what is angle FED? And I don't necessarily mean the numerical values. So you have to look at the sign convention or the notation convention I talked about. So where instrument is at point E, we're backsiding point F, we're foresighting point D. So, so if, if we're doing it that way, backsiding, um, backsiding um, F, foresighting, D, the, the normal convention is that you measure what I call angles to the right. You say, swing the telescope to the right. And so that would be the angle. Then I said, what is the angle to the right at point F? So this is point F. 
And in this case, we have to look at the notation. Fortunately, this is alphabetical and we're going in some kind of a sequence. You know, if this was point one, this was point 32, this was point 43, this was dog, this was cat, uh, then you can't see what the implied direction is from looking at the notation on the traverse station names. But because we're going from E to F to G, what is the angle to the right at F would imply that you set up at F backside previous point, which is E, you foresight the next point, which is G, so an angle to the right would be this angle here. In this particular case, you can also determine the numeric value by subtracting 145 from 360. Then I said, what is the deflection angle at EDC? What is the deflection angle EDC? So EDC would mean set up here at D, backside E and foresight to C, which means you invert the telescope for deflection angles and then swing to the left. So this would be 80, in this particular case, you can actually figure it out that it's 85 degrees to the left. What is angle CBA? So CBA would mean that we have the instrument set up at B, backsiding C, foresighting A, and so it would be this angle right there. And then what is the interior angle at B? Uh, so the interior angle at B would be this one, right? And that was a trick question. This is an open traverse, so there's no such thing as an interior angle. So hopefully if this is on an exam, there would be a choice that says none of the above, and that's what you would pick. So I admit I'm being a little tricky here, but that could easily happen on an exam. If you have any questions, uh, uh, speak up. I can hear you. I'm wearing a, a, an earpiece. And, um, and uh, I'm trying to monitor the chat, which is why I'm pausing um, to see if everything is working out. Uh, are people having trouble with the video? Uh, they were, but they got it squared away. Okay, good. All right, so traverse adjustment is an important aspect of surveying control. You can use it to, uh, so when I say traverse adjustment, I probably should change this and say computation or calculation, because long before you get to adjusting the traverse, you can use the process that you use to adjust the traverse, the early parts, to get some idea of whether you have blunders or at least the big ones. You might be able to pick out what kinds of errors you have and they make, can make a decision on whether the gap is due to blunders and systematic errors or random errors. Uh, so uh, if it's the first two, uh, you can try to find and fix them uh, because the purpose of traverse adjustment is to only adjust random errors. And that could be a question on any of these exams. It's only random errors. Traverse adjustment can do nothing about blunders or systematic errors. So these are a couple of traverses I sketched just showing these, these gaps when you calculate, you know. And you should be aware if you read the textbooks that there are some cool techniques which I have actually used. So if a traverse closes like this, and if you think that the problem is an angle, what you can do is draw the closing line and then draw what's called the perpendicular bisector. And the perpendicular bisector will usually point towards the angle that's a problem. Uh, I still remember the first time I had to use this, uh, I was sick in bed and my party chief called me up and said, uh, this was a huge traverse. Uh, it was huge for him anyway, probably 40 sides. And he said he did that N minus two times 180 check because he knows to do that in the field before he even jumps in the truck to drive home. Uh, but it was late in the day and he was really frustrated because it was off by two degrees. So, uh, so he sent me the data, I was sick in bed. <laughs> he came by and dropped the data off. 
and uh, I did some calculating and told him, okay, next morning, go out with your crew and check these two angles. And he did, and one of them happened to have the problem because this thing pointed at two angles. I couldn't decide which ones, and I actually told him if they weren't it to progressively, progressively check outward from there, it was on a 40-sided traverse. Um, and, and, and of course, I could have had more than one angle problem. The other thing you can do with closing lines, so I just so I don't mess up my figure, I have this other one here, is if a line doesn't close and you think it's a distance problem, one of the things you might do is go remeasure lines that are roughly parallel to that closing line. So this one could be one, this one could be another. And uh, these could be uh, questions on the exam about how you troubleshoot uh, a traverse, and that's why I, I bring these up. Uh, and believe it or not, these things work. Uh, they don't, they're not 100% foolproof, they don't always work, but they can save you a lot of work. So with traverse computations, there's basically six steps. Um, you, you check your angular error first, then you adjust the angles. Then you determine the directions of all your courses on your, on your traverse. Then you calculate the latitudes and departures. Uh, if you don't know what that is, we'll cover that here in a second. Uh, then we can calculate the error of closure and the accuracy, or maybe the precision, make some decisions, uh, adjust your latitudes and departures so that the traverse actually closes because you've compensated hopefully only for the random error. And then you can calculate your station coordinates. So I have here a little sketch I did Latitudes are the north-south components of a line. So let me just go over this sketch here. So here's a line going off in this direction. Based on its bearing or its azimuth and its length, you can ca calculate the east-west and north-south components of the line. Now many of you probably are used to call the, calling these delta northings and delta eastings. Just know that on the exam you can be expected to refer to them as the latitude and the departure. So the latitude is the north-south component of the delta y or the delta northing. Departure is the delta easting or the delta x. And so I tell people, if you're having a lot of trouble, remember that the second letter in departure is e. So maybe that can help you remember that departures go east-west. Now keep in mind, in this particular case, it's this line is going northeasterly, so the departure and the latitude are both positive. If it's in the northwesterly direction, the latitude would be positive and the departure would be negative and so forth. So here's a traverse uh, that I'm going to uh, run through, uh, do a few calculations. So these are what we call field angles. And here's the field distances. And here's a given, it says here assume, but there's a given bearing for this line south 81, 42, 15 east. And uh, I want to point out this is unadjusted. So the first thing you do is you add up all your field angles and it adds up to 540, 0230. And most of you, if you've done traverses, may be laughing because you'd say, well, I never have this kind of angular error. This is uh, taken from a textbook, so just play along. And uh, and, uh, you know, 30 seconds may be a more reasonable number to have for a professional surveyor. But you compare it to n minus 2 times 180, which is 540. So in this particular case, we are over the required number by 2 minutes and 30 seconds. So what you can do is uh, make some decisions. How am I going to adjust these angles? such that they add up to 540 degrees exactly. Well, the easy solution in a situation like that, unless you know in actual field practice, certainly on the exam, you wouldn't be given this you would be given this information kind of a leading uh, clue that maybe one angle needs to be adjusted a little bit differently, is to divide your total error by the number of angles and then adjust by some round number. The thing you don't do is uh, 
adjust your angles by uh, 0 0.1375 seconds. Uh, if you have that kind of a situation, you usually round to the nearest second or the nearest five seconds or 10 seconds, whatever is reasonable for the kinds of measurements you're making. This is a totally different subject, but most people using the uh, total stations that read to one second probably are not measuring angles any better than to an accuracy of about five to 10 to 15 seconds. So here's what the adjusted angles look like. So over here, I said adjust by 30. So these have been adjusted. So you do a little check. This is a big part of the process to always run checks as you go along so that you know that the data that you have compiled for yourself up to this point uh, um, <laughs> Rob, I, uh, I'm a little surprised that you haven't heard of this. Anyway, um, I'm just reading the chat. So yeah, you make sure the, that you... Uh, it was the bisector of the angle pointing, or the, yep. the line pointing to the angle. It was like... So, so I hate to... Maybe so so thank you for... It. No, no, thank you for pointing it out because you have forgotten it. Almost every good surveying textbook, so I have an older edition here of uh, Wolf and Gilani. It's now all Gilani. Um, I was looking at uh, Moffitt and Bouchard because I used that as a standard text for a long time. It's now Bosley and Moffitt, I think, or something like that. Almost every one of them in the Traverse section will have something similar to what I just said about the perpendicular bisector. And while you, Rob, maybe don't remember it, it's a really important thing that when you go into the exam, those of you who are planning on taking an exam of one shape or another in the next months or years, or to remember that these are there because pretty much anything in those textbooks is fair game. And that's why I threw all, all these things because I didn't want to just run in and compute a traverse, you know, and just stop there. Yeah, Jerry Mahoon just, uh commented that a distance bus to distance error will have the same direction as the linear closer direction, which of course I remember because back in the day when I started, we actually taped our traverses. We didn't have those fancy schmancy electronics. And um, that was where we would typically see our, our problems, maybe losing a hundred foot tape in a, in a long traverse or something. Yeah. And, and don't say losing, because losing means they think these people, the younger people, are thinking you physically lost the tape along the way. Right. But, but, but anyway, uh, but they can go look up dropping a chain in, in the surveying textbooks. I have a feeling they may still say that, uh, use that term. By the way, in that case where I actually use the perpendicular bisector, this field, party chief was a temporary party chief. He was party chief because I was sick that sick enough that day that I couldn't go in the field. So uh, he made a mistake reading his angles, basically. He had a blunder, uh, but this thing was great at catching it. All right, so I just throw in this pa parenthetical note here that uh, line DE has a certain uh, given bearing. So I'm not going to calculate all the bearings in this traverse, but I'm going to do a couple. So the adjusted angle for point E over here, uh, uh, we had a line that went off in this direction, southeasterly line. Uh, but to calculate it, what we need to do actually is look at it the opposite direction, and I'll show you why I say this. So we have a 90 degree angle. And uh, oh, 96 degree angle, 38 minutes, 15 seconds. And at point A, the adjusted angle is 645300. But the lines we're trying to calculate are these red lines and may not make much sense. So I have a little picture of the traverse here because what we're trying to do is calculate this one here. This is point E and this is point A up here. But the bearing of line DE comes in this way. And that's why I had this original line drawn in black going off in the southeasterly direction. But when you are at point E and try to determine the bearing of EA, 
you to position yourself at E and look towards D. And so that's why I drew it the other way, because this is the back bearing of line DE, which is the forward bearing of ED. So we have the 81, 42, 15 right here, because it's now northwest. And then we have, uh, have this angle over here. And so hopefully you can see that if you subtract one from the other, you get the bearing angle for uh, EA. Um, you should be able to do that math fairly simply, and that's north 1456 east. And I don't know if you do it this way, but when I'm trying to write stuff fast, I don't put in degrees, minutes, and second symbols. I should just use a dash. Um, and if you're doing uh, this kind of math on the exam, by the way, one of the things you need to remember is when you get to the minutes and seconds, if you have single digit seconds to remember to put a zero in front, because it's real easy when you're adding up rows of numbers uh, to lose track of whether you've got uh, single seconds or a two digit seconds value. So over here, remember we've determined it's 1456. So this is that 1456 angle. And then we have the 64, uh, 53, uh, 5330. So we can add those two to come up with the bearing of AB uh, using the similar kind of thinking of 7949 West. And you, I know you can't read this. But when you get the slides, you'll see this as the calculation for all the bearings in this traverse. All right, so how do you calculate these latitudes and departures? Again, remember your latitude is your delta northing, your departure is your delta easting. So it's simple, distance, the length of the line times the cosine of the bearing angle for the latitude and the sine of the bearing angle for the departure. Uh, so there's quite a few steps here if you're using a calculator because you've got to take that angle which you have in degrees, minutes, and seconds, convert it to decimal degrees, then take the sine and then multiply by the length. So don't forget to do all those things because on the exam, you know, you'll have four answers there that you have to set, select from, you know, A, B, C, and D. If you're doing a state-specific exam, you might even have a few more. Keep in mind that uh, one of them is the best answer, not the correct answer necessarily, because sometimes there's no correct answer and you need to figure out which the best one is. Uh, it may be that one is carried out to a larger number of decimal places or has been rounded, and this, that, and the other. And the other three are what we call logical distractors, meaning if you don't know or not being careful, you might easily come up with this. And I know, having come up <laughs> with exams, both for my students, as well as having written exams for a whole variety of uh, uh, tests, all in all quite far back in time, including NCWS and some state specific exams, that when I do logical distractors, for sure as heck, one of the logical distractors is going to be where I took the sine and cosine without converting degrees, minutes, and seconds to decimal. And, and you will have that number there. And what's a great tendency on the part of test takers is, oh, this matches up exactly to what I got. You know, what's the chance on a numerical problem that I would randomly come up with the correct answer. So this must be the answer. I don't need to check my work. You check, off, check it off or circle it or whatever, select it and off you go. So be a little careful about that. So this is just a telling, reminding you about the algebraic signs. And you should know this if you know the delta northing, delta easting thing with latitudes and departures. Uh, when we teach uh, latitudes and departures the conventional way, um, uh, when we, uh, 
if you already know it's uh, delta nothing and delta easting, you don't need this. But when we used to teach bearings the, and Travis calculation the conventional way, we had to spend a lot of time reminding our students to do this because most of the time they were using the bearing angle. Now, there is an easier way. And that is if you know how to use your calculator properly, you can actually use the azimuth. Uh, for me, I found a long, long, long time ago, uh, probably by the second year of practice as a land surveyor, that it, I was a lot better off and less prone to have mistakes in my work if I did all my calculations using azimuths and only changed back to bearings if the work warranted it. In fact, I published surveys that had azimuths on them. Um, sometimes I would get a little bit of trouble from people who didn't know what an azimuth was until I explained it to them and they go, oh, that's what we did in the military. How come you guys don't use that all the time? Uh, but anyway, that's beside the point. So if you use the azimuth angle, here's the cool thing. So in a case like this, for example, if this is north, the azimuth angle is something between 90 and 180. And when you take the sine and cosine, you would magically find that the uh, departure would be a positive number because it's going easterly, but that the latitude would be a negative number because it's going in a southerly direction. So that's the cool thing about using azimuths. It automatically generates the sign for you regardless of which quadrant uh, your direction is. So what I've done is, again, from this textbook, because I was being lazy, uh, I have all these calculated bearings, I have all these uh, lengths of the lines. So using either the bearing equations or the azimuth equations, if, you, if I chose to convert these to, to azimuths, I can then generate latitudes and departures uh, for these lines. Now remember, this is supposed to be a closed traverse. So your first check then is to add these up and check to see if these add up to zero. And I just... Uh, wanted to make sure that you can see, you know, these are all rows in an imaginary table. Now, when you look at this carefully, you notice I have station out here. So station can't be, let me just back up and show you those lines. Station can't be the line for a bearing or, or a distance. It has to be the length between two stations as in AB, all right? So be very careful about that. The most common tables that you, that you would construct, you actually skip a line if you're going to show things like coordinates and angles measured at a point, uh, as well as uh, the length and bearing of lines. So down here, uh, whoops, okay. So when we, when you add those up, you can then get a sum of all your latitudes and the sum of, oops, that's your departures. This is the sum of all your latitudes. And so you can take the square root of the sum of the squares. And so in this particular traverse, you have an area in departure of uh, 1.05, area in departure of negative 0.68. So you have a total area. You can actually calculate the length of your closing line. So the precision is basically calculated by taking uh, one over uh, your perimeter divided by the error of closure. So in our case, the perimeter is 3739.48. And so when we uh, divide it out, we get one a precision of one to 2898, which typically you would probably round to one in 2900 or even one in 3000. But one of the things I'd like to tell people that the way the exams are changing and the way surveying technology is changing, you might have to be prepared at some point to be reporting out this precision as a PPM, parts per million number. So one in 2,900 precision is equivalent to 345, a survey where if you ran 2,900 feet, you would have one foot of error is the same as having 345 feet of error in a million feet of traverse. 
That's what it means. And here's how you do the conversion. You simply take the one over 2,900, multiply it by a million. Hopefully you all realize that 10 to the sixth power is the same as a million. It's a little bit of short, uh, sh shorthand. And I think, yeah, so this is 1 million here. Did, did uh, uh, write it out completely. So it means that you have 345 feet of error in a million feet of survey. And so if you want to check it the other way, if you had 345 ppm, you divide it by 1 million, and then you take the reciprocal. You know, the reciprocal is the 1 over x key on your calculator, which inverts, inverts the fraction. So uh, adjusting the traverse, uh, unfortunately, Many people run through Travers computations by simply pressing a button on their PC software. Uh, they don't look at the data very carefully. And to me, from a private practice point of view or practical point of view, uh, I'm not sure that surveyors uh, spend enough time analyzing their data. Uh, as far as adjusting a Travers is concerned, there are many ways to adjust them. Uh, we have the compass rule, the transit rule, we have something called Crandall's rule. There are many people who speak for adjusting a traverse by using a judgment to figure out where to adjust it to make it close or to use least squares. On the exams, generally, uh, compass rule is the only one you're expected to know how to do. Uh, these others are probably going to be, could be discussion questions. Uh, and I just wanted to mention that the compass rule roughly uh, assumes that there's equal precision in your angles and distances. And the question is, how do you even know that? That's not a question for this particular session today. It's very easy to determine equivalency between angles and distances. Transit rule assumes as much greater accuracy in the angles, meaning you're not using a compass because that's where they went to when they were using uh, the compass, they went to uh, transits. Uh, Crandall's rule, rule assumes much greater distance accuracy. And the only thing I can think of, because I haven't researched this, is that when EDM came out, Mr. Crandall uh, came up with this. It's actually a, a semi-least squares approach. Arbitrary uh, adjustment can be called arbitrary if you just randomly go in and change them. But if you're thoughtful about where the mistakes may have happened, uh, you had a particularly bad site where you had a lot of heat shimmer, for example. Uh, or, so you had trouble generating the distance. You had to keep trying until you got a distance. Or you had, uh, you had a construction site with some very heavy machinery where you were making an angle measurement, you know, you might decide that perhaps there's more uncertainty in those recorded values, and maybe there should be more adjustment there to make the traverse close. And then with least squares, technically the most scientifically proper, but it has to be used with knowledge and understanding. You can't just throw a bunch of data at least squares and then say, oh, I did it the right way, or I did it the best way, because there are many ways to misuse this process. That's about all I'll say here, because it involves uh, proper weighting. And what I'm finding out as I talk to people is that most of the time they are not weighting their data correctly. Uh, there is a manual process to do least squares observation. I've actually done them as part of a college course, but it's tedious. And so most people use software of one kind or another. What I say is when the technology is used with no thought, we have GIGO garbage in, garbage out. And so be very careful in terms of actual practice to make sure you avoid that. So the goal, so by the way, the compass rule is also sometimes referred to as Bowditch, uh, the Bowditch rule named after Nathaniel Bowditch, uh, who I, I am assuming invented the process or at least was the first to publish it, you know. Some of these things were not really invented by the thing, by the people they're named after. They were the first people to publish it, however. So the goal is to adjust the latitudes and departures so they add up to zero using some kind of rational method. And the rule is to simply proportion the adjustment 
based on the ratio of each line to the total traverse length. So here's how you adjust your latitudes and departures. Once you come up with a non-zero sum, you take the length of the line, you divide it by the total traverse length. So what you're doing is you're saying, I have so much error in my traverse, and I'm gonna adjust each line by the length of the line in proportion to the total length of the traverse. You notice I have a negative sign here. So you take the opposite of the actual sign, then you came up with your sum of latitudes and departures. So I'm just gonna do a single adjustment uh, in a little bit of detail. So this is line CD. It had a length of 677.97. The latitude was negative 669.14. The departure was 109.08. The perimeter, the traverse, total traverse length was 3739.48. The area in latitude and departures was, was uh, minus uh, 0.68 and plus one point, it's actually 1.05. I don't know how that happened, but I have a typo there. So the way you substitute in the equation is the length of the line divided by the total traverse length. So you notice it's the same fraction in both adjustment to the latitude and the departure. You multiply it by the opposite of the sign of the area in latitudes and the area in departures. So this is what you do, you take these adjustments and you go back to your latitude and departure and adjust them by a little bit. And once you finish, then they add up to zero. So that's the check. So first of all, you make sure that your area in latitudes and area in uh, departure are equal to your corrections in latitude and departure, but of opposite sign. And once you've applied them, you then check to make sure you have zero, zero. And so these are the adjusted latitudes and departures. There's the length of the line. Now, some of you who are sharp enough may notice that if you've adjusted the latitudes and departures, this line length probably is not correct anymore. And so we'll talk about inversing and, and so is the bearing. The bearing or direction has also changed a little bit. So, uh, Oh, so before I go on, I just wanted to show you that there's a slight difference in how you do the calculation. If you're adjusting by the transit rule, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but I just wanted to give you one more example if you're interested in checking it out. So I want to move on to inversing. So inversing is how you take either a latitude and a departure or uh, coordinates and subtract them to get the latitude and departure to figure out the direction of the line and its length. So generally you do it from adjusted or balanced. We use those two terms kind of simultaneous, uh, synonymously, uh, latitudes and departures. And as I've implied from coordinates, uh, when you have balanced latitudes and departures, as I said, you've adjusted the length of the line as well as its direction. This is subtle, all right? And many books, especially if they are books that are not really comprehensive, may not actually get into the fact that you have now changed the geometry of each line. So the, it's pretty simple. So here's a latitude, here's a departure, here's the new line. You want to find out what its length is. Well, that's Pythagoras, right? The sum of the squares of the two sides, you guys all know this. I don't think I need to go into it. By the way, GPS uses the same Pythagorean theorem except in three axes to figure out the distance, the initial estimate of the distance from the antenna phase center to the satellite. Uh, you don't need to worry about it. That's why I put it in a slightly different color because I don't want you to distract, be distracted from traverse calculations. But whenever you get to reading a book on GPS, uh, like Van Sickle's book or something like that, uh, don't be surprised to see Pythagorean theorem, except in three axes uh, show up, whereas we are dealing with just two axes, a simple planar system. When it comes to the bearing of the line, you take the arc tangent or inverse tangent of the departure divided by the latitude, and that'll generate for you this angle right here. 
And then you have to take the fact that in this particular case, if this is the line, the fact that we have a negative departure and a positive latitude, if you're going from here to here, uh, this would mean that this is a north-west uh, bearing. Now, some calculators will actually allow you to put in, if you have this rectangular to polar conversion function, and that's common in the HP, but there are other uh, calculators that will do it too. If you put in the appropriate algebraic signs for the departure and latitude, it'll actually give you a result uh, that, it, that is uh, correct from zero to 180, it'll be a positive number. And if the line happens to go off in this direction, it'll give you this angle which is a counterclockwise angle, so it'll be displayed as negative in your calculator. And so if you know how to use it and you play around with it well before you go to take an exam, you might be able to, um, to use it to a little bit of advantage because it saves you a little bit of time. Nothing noteworthy on the uh, chat, just some keyboard issues. Okay, see, I see that. <laughs> Maybe somebody fell asleep on the uh, whatever key that is. I'm not wearing my glasses, so I can't tell. Yeah. Anyway, anyway uh, so you figured out the latitude and departure are delta northing and delta easting of the line's endpoints. Uh, so to compute coordinates is fairly, fairly easy. You simply uh, know or assume the coordinates of one point in a traverse, and then you can use the latitudes and departures to calculate the successive coordinates. So here's uh, the example from B to E. Again, when you get the slide, uh, excuse me, B to A, you'll be able to go back and see how knowing the coordinate of uh, B, you can now calculate the coordinate of A. And this is just a separate traverse altogether where you can go ad infinitum or ad nauseum, depending on which term you prefer, calculating uh, coordinate after coordinate. So this is the listing of coordinates. And what I saw here, because as I said, this is from a textbook, I think it might be McCormick, is what they did was they decided to set point C to have uh, an easting of 100 and point E to have a northing of 100. So you might want to remember that because we'll come back and look at that here in a sec. So, so this is the figure, this is what the figure looks like. And what they did was they just arbitrarily said, E is the most southerly point. So I'm going to give it a northerly co coordinate of 100. Uh, a C is the most westerly point. I'm going to arbitrarily give it an easting of 100. Now what I tend to like to do is actually move the axes even closer and make uh, the easting of C zero and the northing of E zero. And there's a, there's a couple of reasons for that that I like. But anyway, uh, that's how those get generated. Now, I just wanted to point out that when you look at these corners, uh, you can't always tell what is the most southerly and most westerly, especially if you have dozens of points. You have, uh, if you have a computer, it, you, it can actually do it for you quite quickly. But if you're doing it by hand, it can be a little tedious. But if you have a small number of points by inspection, you can look for and find and set, meaning that you don't have to set A to be 1,000, 1,000, or 10,000, 10,000, or 1 million, 1 million, and so forth. So I want to move on to area computation. So area by coordinates. Uh, and also just briefly mention irregular and curved boundaries. And I'll start there. So when we have uh, areas like this, if you look at the textbooks, and this is what you're supposed to follow if you get a question like this on the exam, if you have an irregular corner like this, one of the things you can do is draw a straight line and then measure offsets at some interval. And that interval is the surveyor's judgment. So that could be 10 feet, it could be 150 feet, and you measure these things, so you wind up with a set of what are called trapezoids. 
And with these trapezoids then, where these sides are parallel to each other, you can uh, use that formula there, which is you take uh, the lengths to the points of the, in this case, the shoreline, you average them, uh, so that's why you're dividing by two, and then you multiply by D, the space between your offsets. Now here we have regular offsets, but you can also have irregular offsets depending on the shape of that irregular boundary that you're trying to include in to get your area. Oh, so I meant to mention this because this could be a question. Uh, at least the old guys like it. Uh, what's a planimeter? You know, planimeter is a mechanical device where you uh, draw an area to scale and you use this mechanical device. Uh, it's actually called a mechanical integrator to calculate the area of a figure. And this was very common uh, in uh, many fields, uh, especially engineering, and highways. I think a lot of DOTs had tons of planimeters, uh, foresters, a whole bunch of people, soil scientists and so forth. So here's an interesting situation where we have a uh, straight-sided figure with one side that's curved and you can actually find, uh, I believe, the um, I called it the, the cheat sheet, the, uh, the pages of equations that you're given for the PS and FS exam actually have, has the equation for calculating uh, this part uh, that's cut off between the circle, the circular arc, and the long chord, where you know th some other uh, facets of the curve, in this case, the central angle, and the, the radius. Uh, there's um, some other COGO stuff that we don't have time for today, like bearing, bearing intersections, distance, distance intersections, bearing distance intersections, and all kinds of other coordinate geometry stuff. But we'll get to a few things. But probably from a surveying point of view, the logical place to go to after traversing is side shots. So here's a traverse, uh, you know, here's point G, here's point F, here's point E, so there's other parts to the traverse. But while at point F, we take a side shot, meaning we measure this 8515 angle to point P1, and we measure this 310 degree 30 minute angle to point P2, and we have those distances. So side shots are pretty easy. Once you compute your traverse, you calculate the adjusted coordinate for point F. And then what you have to do uh, is take the azimuth between F and E, the azimuth between the adjusted coordinates, not the unadjusted values. And then you would simply add uh, these two values to get the azimuths going out to P1 and P2. And then you simply do a latitude and departure computation for each one and add those values to the northings and eastings of F to get the northings and eastings of P1 and P2. Whoops, uh, I'll come back to it. So we're going to move on to areas first. I, f I forgot. I had put that in there and then as a teaser, and I was going to get back to it later, but I wound up exposing the methodology already, which is fine. So simple area calculations. So before we figure out that big, f that big area, I wanted to show you that if you have a simple area, it's a five-sided figure. One of the things I like to do when I have uh, figures that I'm going to calculate by what's called the coordinate method, uh, what I like to do is try to see if I can get a couple of zeros in there. If you can figure out where the high, uh, where the uh, most westerly and southerly points are. So in this particular case, it turns out that the most southerly and westerly points are the same point A. You see the coordinate axis down here. And, uh, and it would take too long. Uh, I actually have a detailed explanation of this, but it would take too long. And the simplest way um, is a little embarrassing to show you, but it works every time. So when you, Calculating areas by the coordinate method, the first thing you do is list them in order. Second thing you do is repeat 
the first coordinate at the bottom of your list. So what I'm going to do is take A, and I know it's zero, but you still list it down here. So now, what I'm going to do is multiply a weird thing, multiply this first northing by the second easting. So zero times 50 is zero. And I'm going to put a line here to indicate the direction I'm going in because it's real easy to get lost. Then I multiply 300 by 225. And that comes out to be in 67,500. Then we have 450 times 550, and that's 247,5. And then, this is why I like to have zeros, we have another zero. So I only have to add up two numbers on this column, turns out to be 315,000. So let me change colors here. So I'm going to go the other way from 0 to 300. So that's a 0. 50 multiplied by 450 gives me 225. 225 by 175 gives me 39375. Uh, the PDF will have all this uh, uh, digital ink on it, so you don't have to worry about trying to figure all this out from memory. And then the last product is the 550 times a zero, so we have a zero. So this adds up to 61875. So it turns out, if we subtract these two numbers, it equals twice the area. And this is the one time in surveying where it doesn't matter if it's a negative sign, if it turns out the first column is, is smaller than the second column, you just ignore the negative sign. So I could put absolute value symbols in front of it. So, the, so twice the area is equal to 253, 125. Let me just change colors back to red. Um, so, so the actual area of the figure then is 126, 562.5, and I'm just going to say square units, because haha, -ha, you probably thought this was feet. What if this was meters or chains or something else? So uh, it's whatever that unit is. If it happens to be feet, then you could divide by 43560 to get the area in acres. So that's how the coordinate method works. You guys are being very quiet. Um, not even laughing at my jokes. All right. So uh, there's all another. Muted. We're all muted here. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Um, so the uh, other thing I wanted to say is that when you have a big, complicated traverse, sometimes how do you know you didn't make a mistake? And you can go over your numbers, but if you have the time, an exam, this might, might, might not be the situation, but on an exam, hopefully they don't give you a very large figure so you can go back over the numbers. But if you're going back over the numbers and you're doing this by hand, uh, One thing you can do is call the DMD method, which stands for double meridian distance. It's in all standard surveying textbooks. It's another way for calculating area. And, uh, and what you do here is you, uh, um, not going to actually work through this, but you can check it uh, after after you get the notes to see if you come up with the same area. This is actually the same figure. I have it drawn down here. So I have the latitude and departure, which obviously I can calculate from the coordinates that I gave you. And so what you can do is say, what's the DMD? So the DMD, you follow these rules. The DMD is the first departure. So it turns out to be 50 here. Then it's... Uh, it's the previous, oh, I better bring up the calculator because I know I can 
uh, lose my way. All right, so let me clear this. And uh, so if you read, it says, take the previous DMD, which is 50. And then the previous departure, which is also 50. And then the current departure, which is 175. And I get 275. So that's the next DMD. So next DMD after that, we're still on rule number two. So it's the previous DMD, which is 275, plus the previous departure, which is 175. And then the current departure, which is 325. And then the final DMD follow the same rule. So it's 775 plus 325. And then minus 550. And I think I made a mistake. Let's see. I better start this process over. Let's just start over. So I have 775 plus 325 minus 550 and I get 550. And the reason I want to mention this is that um, the last rule is there's a check. The last DMD must equal the last departure except for the sign. It should be opposite in sign. So now it's a simple process of taking each DMD and multiplying it by its corresponding latitude. So this would be 300 times 50, which would be 15, 0, 0, 0. I'm not going to do the others in my head. But you add these up and you should, I um, mean, that'll be the double area. You take half of that and you should get the same area as we got from the previous calculation. Yeah, this uh, DMD method is also handy for uh, calculating um, an average end area for uh, end areas of a cross section, and then the next cross section to get a volumetric calculation in between. That's yep. something that's uh, common in route surveying, particularly. Except that's right. instead of working in a horizontal plane, you're looking at that cross section at area for vertical plane yeah exactly a vertical plane with offset and elevation sorry about that okay so for our traverse we have these coordinates and one of the things I could do is say, wait a minute, I want to make my math simpler. So I'm going to reduce each of these values by 100 so that I wind up with zero here. And I'm, I could reduce all of these values by 100 so I get a zero here. So I'm not going to write those numbers in because it, it would get really cluttered. So I did that and here's the numbers I got and you'll have this when you get get the notes uh, but I got uh, so when I multiplied these out I got and magically a zero here Magically a zero there. Oh, I forgot. I needed to repeat A down here. Which I reduced to 757. 
and this would have been reduced to 1271. Um, by the way, uh, one of the things I will mention is that uh, when I have small traverses like this, I often go looking for the smallest northing and then I subtract that from all the values and the smallest easting and I subtract them from all the other eastings just to get those zeros because it's really handy to have it in there. That's a zero. That's a zero. It turns out if you do all this adding up, you come up with 16.18 acres if you assume that all these dimensions are feet. And it's a fairly straightforward process. The only problem is that you can get lost in the simple arithmetic uh, because it's easy to get lost. So this is the quick check using the different numbers and actually use these numbers for the information that you see on the previous one. Okay, so here's the, here's the side chart example. So basically, uh, the biggest problem for you guys might be the fact that we have uh, um, the azimuth of EF is 345. So EF would be in this direction. But if you set up at F backsiding E, we have 180 minus that 300, and that's why I have 12045. And then I add the, this is for point two, then I add the 31030 to it, which gives me 431 degrees. And obviously, our circle only goes up to 360. So we normalize it by subtracting 360 to get 70, 71 degrees. Uh, 15 minutes over here. But when we do that and take the sine and cosine of that and multiply it by the 167.89, we get the delta northing and the delta easting to give us, if we add those to the value, to the coordinates for station F, we get the coordinates of station P2. And then for P1, you can do the same thing except so it's still the 120.45, and I showed you how I calculated that, but now we're adding 85.15 to get the azimuth to point P2, and we use that 98.76. So kind of the last topic, although I had three different things here, is the midpoint of a line. So if you have a line, how do you calculate the midpoint of a line? So what I've seen people do, because I teach a lot of state-specific exam prep courses, and we run through some of these, and what students typically do is say, well, let me figure out the delta northing and delta easting first. And so we get um, negative 593.90 and a negative 1060.80. And you might wonder, why am I saying negative? Well, that's just because it's A to B. So we're going from the upper right-hand corner to the lower left-hand corner. So if you're following the direction, BA would be positive departure and positive latitude, but AB would be negative. And so what they would do is they would inverse between the two to get uh, 240, 45, 26, and then they would determine the length of the line, which is 1215.736, then they would divide by that 2 and say it's 600 and something, and then they would calculate the latitude of departure using that azimuth for the 615 line, and then add that latitude and departure to these coordinates to get the midpoint of the line. But hopefully some of you at least uh, realize that the midpoint of the line is really simple. You simply take the average of the northings and the average of the eastings. So, so what you should get, if you want to do this on your own, I'm just going to write the answer here. So this is coordinate geometry, believe it or not. This is the simplest form, one of the simplest 
things you can do in coordinate geometry. And it means having kind of a mental picture of the math that goes in. So finding the midpoint of a line, if you know the coordinates of the endpoint, simply involves averaging the coordinates, and that's all. So I wanted to point that out. So similarly, what if you want the third points? And this could be like a subdivision where you have uh, something like this going on. perhaps lot lines. Uh, I just freehanded the third points, but two points on the line that divide the line up into three equal parts. Uh, this could be an engineering type survey. You know, this could be where the bents or the piers or something like that go in. It's just as easy. So you take that same difference in, in uh, northing and easting, but now you take one third. So one third of the delta N would be 197.967, I just carried three decimal places for simplicity on a big board, and the delta, um, the delta E would be 353.60. So you take the 2137.85 and the 1152.60 and add these values, and you'd come up with uh, oops, you know what? I think I made a mistake on the previous slide. So you get twenty three thirty five point eight two plus and fifteen oh six twenty for the first third point. So let me just back up to the previous slide. This is this isn't the right number. I put I used the third point, but you guys can do the math. So I'll just uh, take all this out so you're not confused by it. And similarly, you could now take that same one third N and one, one third delta N and one third delta E and add it to these values to come up with these values. Now, keep in mind that you can also use it for proportioning. So here's the situation, it's the same line AB, the same coordinates for the endpoints, all right? And uh, we figured out that this thing was, if you inverse between the coordinates, now here you would have to do this if they didn't give it to you. If you inverse between the coordinates and found 1215.736 uh, and an azimuth, uh, you don't really need this, but I'll write it down, 4526. So the map shows that this is 1220, right? So there's a shortage. And the map shows between the endpoint and point M, 200 feet, between M and L, 850 feet, and then the rest over there. How do you proportion it? So one of the things you can do then is say, here's my proportioning factor. If I'm trying to show what it is in present day units, it would be 1215.736 over 1220. And you simply use that as a multiplier on uh, the deltas to figure out the uh, today's current positions for M and L based on your measurements for what the, for the map or plat shows for those distances on that line. So that pretty much covers the topics I wanted to cover today. I'm more than happy to answer questions. Uh, feel free to write to me um, and uh, I'll be happy to answer. Can't promise I'll always give you an instantaneous response. Um, uh, so I don't know about uh, what the ta tavern part is. But thanks, uh, looks like uh, Jerry put up a link to a planimeter. Uh, thank you for that, Jerry. Uh, planimeters are fun things to figure out how they use, how, how they work. And Dolson that's it slide. for me. Those and slide rules, you gotta get a slide rule too. And <laughs> you, can't, you can't get all those garbage, garbage digits like a calculator gives you. 
<laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, there was a time when I was first started teaching because it was the late seventies where I would actually teach students how to use planimeters uh, for some of the more advanced work they had to do in their surveying classes because there was no, uh, well, actually what I had them do, is that a slide rule you're holding up? Uh, uh, so we would actually take uh, a mapped area like a watershed and then start by first putting a grid on the watershed and count the dots that fell inside the watershed. And then you would have to figure out, well, what's the scale and what, what does each grid point represent for area? And uh, then we'd use the planimeter. And, uh, and then there was one other method. I don't know if you used it, Jerry, but we would draw the thing to scale and then cut it out and weigh it. We'd go over to the chemistry lab and weigh it on a, a precise balance to try and get the area because we would have a, have a standard area. We'd, we'd figure out the weight of a standard area and then we'd look at the, eight of, the weight of the piece of paper that covered the watershed to try and, and so we compared methods because back then uh, it wasn't all that easy to come up with areas. And looks like you got a T2 or a T1 picture cut away behind you. All right, so, um, so, so, so any, anything else or are we done for the day, uh, Rob? Uh, real quick, I'm gonna just flash up it. This is a, um, electronic version of the uh, mechanical that Jerry had shown on his screen. Yeah, we used to actually sell that. When I worked at Sokia, we sold a lot of those. That's what I thought. Um, I think that these have the capability where you could do um, a, a different scale for X and Y. So if you yes, have, yes, uh, like an exaggerated um, cross uh, an exaggerated profile or an exaggerated cross section where your horizontal scale may be one inch equals 50 feet but your vertical is one inch equals five feet then that would be a, a variation on your uh, on the, uh, how to do that calculation and, and the uh, digital electronic equipment made that um, easier calculation Yep. In fact, uh, this was Sokia. Sokia also also sold um, range finders. Uh, these were big parallax bars with a prism at one end. And uh, I still remember when we had an astronaut come in to Kansas City to pick up one of these because they had bought it as a backup a method for docking. And they were docking first with the Gina rockets and later on with the lunar modules. They needed to estimate, and I don't know what technology they were using to figure out how far away these devices were, but they knew everything could fail, so they wanted a backup system, and they literally bought one of our rangefinders uh, to do that. All right, enough of that walking down memory lane. Anything more from you, Rob, or any of the people online? Or have they all fallen asleep? No, uh, we only lost a couple to baby duty and other, uh, uh, other commitments, but um, let's see. I'm, Annie I'm just is still toss here. in a, a, a short, quick ad for my website. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, if you go to my website, I have an open access survey materials website, and I do have a lot of this material on there as well as example, traditional example problems for all these different areas and some self-study problems and stuff that you might find useful. Yeah, I can't, uh, can't overemphasize the importance of being able to do Travis calculations because it's gotten to be where nobody does them anymore, except on their computers. Um, but it's pretty much uh, still a valid topic on any of the exams with the CST or any of the surveying exams. You know, when you go across the country, state specific exams vary a lot in the kinds of content that they ask for but it's even possible for it to show up there the other thing that gets lost with a lot of this computation system by computers and that is a feel for the numbers and the actual accuracy of what you're dealing with 
And a lot of them, that's, you know, I, I joke about the slide rule and stuff, but you had a limited amount of accuracy that you could get out of that that was reflective of the numbers that you were working with. And it's not always the case with computers. So doing some of the stuff manually gives you an appreciation for what is really, what you can really expect coming out of when you put all your measurements together to compute something. Yeah, I love it when people calculate areas of, of tracts and they come up with 167.4876835258 acres. And uh, I always ask him, did you actually measure the area that accurately? And they say, well, that's what it came out to be. Exactly. Uh, Wrong answer. I just, saw, just saw a post the other night on uh, Facebook. Uh, somebody had taken a picture of a, a plot they were, that they were handed apparently. And it had distances to five decimals. <laughs> and uh, so those are the measurements that you're using to get the areas to four, four places. And chances are they're giving that accuracy on something that was originally measured to the nearest, I don't know, half a link or something. Absolutely. That was that one, not much unknown to begin with. Yeah, Jimmy just posted up uh, uh, good stuff and will the recording be available? Yeah, it's coming up about uh, probably towards the week when Trent uh, us up. Um, it'll be available online. And um, yeah, as I think everybody here was uh, probably duly, uh, duly impressed by, by um, just making the computations simple and straightforward. So Dr. Joe Pye, I appreciate that. And uh, uh, Joe, tell me again, the uh online class that you're teaching and that's through the missouri oh state that's the state technical college of missouri so we actually offer several um but the one i'm currently teaching is called land records and it's uh, one of the required courses for licensure in missouri and uh, do you know what's coming up next semester yeah it's uh, legal aspects of boundary surveys so we have some gen generic stuff using Brown's boundary control and legal principles. And then we have about um, five weeks of Missouri specific topics. Missouri's state public land survey system uh, when it comes to restoration of lost corners is unique. Uh, only Arkansas has uh, something similar in terms of how it was surveyed because they were the first to be first two states to be surveyed after the acquisition of the Louisiana purchase. And so many of the standard things that you see out further west uh, are just not there in Missouri. So we spend a lot of time on that because the state expects uh, surveyors applying for licensure in Missouri to know those differences. Sounds reasonable to me. Uh, Danny is asking, uh, what kind of smart board are you using? Because that was pretty amazing technology as well. Yeah, this is this is a standard for our uh, uh, videos here in in our studio for GeoLearn. That's why I listed the GeoLearn uh, website there. But this is actually made by Smart, which is a a uh, Canadian company. And I remember we took one of these boards apart. And we figured out the actual screen is made by somebody else. Gavin, do you remember? So it takes a village to put these things uh, together. And we've got several people behind the scenes running the technology for me. I'm just the talking head here. Uh, but, but it's kind of interesting because you think it's a giant, it's a giant touch screen, but it's not. It's actually, well, it acts like a giant touch screen, but there's actually uh, photo cells that uh, and, re and receivers uh, in a grid pattern and it actually detects the position of the pen based on which uh, line of photo cells you've broken. Uh, probably due for an upgrade one of these years, but these things are not cheap. Oh, excellent. 
Excellent. Uh, with that, are there any other questions? Um, yep, Danny, definitely amazing technology. Any other questions for Dr. Joe? If, uh, uh, if you're too shy to uh, shout out here, you can email him if he can put the address there on the screen. And um, again, thank you, Dr. Joe, for putting this together for us. Um, Looks like everybody's chiming in with uh, thank yous and great presentation comments. Well, thank you. Appreciate you all staying awake. I know this can be uh, very dull. Um, so I hope there was something new that you could take away and use uh, somewhere in your practice uh, or at least in your preparation for and when you take the exam. I wish you all the best. Thank you very much, sir. Have a great evening, everybody else. Uh, we'll see you next uh, Monday, 4 p.m. Pacific time. Have a good evening. All right, thank you.